finally made it to Christmas Eve, even though it feels like Christmas in July, like I said. But here we are. And for me, this is just about the best moment of the whole Christmas season. I love this moment. Not because I love standing in front of you and talking to you. It's, it's not that. It's that everything is done. There's nothing more that you can do. You know, you can't order one more gift. You probably, like, you might be able to stay up all na- night and make some cookies. But who wants to do that? There's nothing more you can do. It, it's all done. Even for me. I'm up here in front of you, I've written what I've written, and I've got to go with what I've got. And there's a certain amount of comfort in that. And as I was reading again these familiar stories from the Gospels about Jesus' birth from Luke and from Matthew's Gospel, and I was thinking about what can anyone say that's different about the story of Jesus' birth than anything that's ever been said before, two things came to me. One thing is, is that there's nothing I can say that's new. And if I say anything that's new or novel, it's not worth saying or hearing. But the other thing I realized is this. When you read the gospel stories about the birth of Jesus, what you come to understand is they're stories that tell you a whole lot about perspective. Have you ever thought about how two people can tell the same story? And one person can tell the story and it's hilarious, and the other person can tell you and it's deadly serious. Have you ever heard two people tell the same story where one people one person tells a story of misery and the other tells a story where everything was wonderful and went fantastically and is delightful? I think sometimes when we think about the birth of Jesus, we get caught up a little bit in different perspectives, and we think that it tells the whole story. I'm actually going to show you two pictures from my house that were taken within a minute of each other, and it's the same place. The first picture is this one. This is my, I I call it like my nativity shrine. I have these nativities that I collect, and I have like eight of them in there. You can't see all of them, but you have the Christmas tree nicely lit. You have the nativity set out, and it looks like such a place of serene calm. And it's a real picture of my house. It's actually like that. But if you step back just a little bit and look, it really looks more like this. And and the reality is, is that, to be honest with you, first of all, this is entirely my fault. I'm I'm the person who is not great about picking up. But the other thing is, is that this is what my house is like a lot of the time. But the question is, is what's really what really is ryan's house actually like is it a mess like this or are there spots of of beauty and order and tranquility and the answer is yes to both of them there are places that are places of relative beauty and tranquility and there are other places that are that are like this they're a mess things are all over everything's out of place and things seem to be falling apart And different people could come to my house at different times and tell a different story about the condition of the Balsam house. Some people would say, wow, they are neatniks. And other people would say, boy, they're slobs. And it's the same house, and we're the same people. It's just a matter of perspective. And as I think about the gospel story, about the birth of Jesus Christ, when God came to us as Emmanuel into the world, I think that the way we hear it and the way we understand it is often a matter of perspective. You see, many times my experience is is that at Christmas time, we have this narrow focus. And we focus on the manger, this image of the Christ child laying there. And sometimes there are more involved pictures. I was looking at Christmas pictures and artwork for hours this week, thinking about just the right image. What I saw is so many of the images are the same. They're this scene of of utter peace and tranquility. And they tell the story of Mary and of Joseph, of the shepherds and the wise men. And they tell the story and it would go something like this. Mary was sitting by herself and an angel appeared to her. And the angel spoke to her and told her that she's favored and that she's going to bear a son and that he will be named Jesus. And out of excitement, she got up and she traveled and she visited her cousin Elizabeth and she shared this news with her. And Elizabeth was pregnant too. And they celebrated together. 
And then we discover that Joseph and Mary were about to be married, and there was a little bit of tension there, but it all worked out in the end. And they had to go from Nazareth down to Bethlehem, which is about 70 miles, which in today's terms isn't so far, but 2,000 years ago was a pretty long trip, especially when you're pregnant. So we have these pictures that we've all seen of Joseph and Mary, where Joseph is calmly and steadily walking with the donkey in tow, and Mary's sitting there kind of across the thing, you know, kind of that English saddle, side saddle style, sitting there, you know, going along. And they get to Bethlehem, and they, they come to this place, and they meet the kindly innkeeper who puts them in the barn in the back where the cattle are lowing. And then there's this scene out in the wilderness where we have the shepherds watching their flocks by night. And the shepherds see this appearance of the angel. And the angels come to them and they say, we bring good news of great joy for all people. And they start singing this heavenly song and the shepherds get up and they go and they head over and they see the Christ child and they worship him. And then the wise men in the east see the star in the sky and they follow it and they travel and they have a little run in with Herod, but it all works out in the end. And they go and they go and they worship the Christ child and bring him their magnificent gifts. That is a true story. That is one perspective on the birth of Jesus. And it's a true perspective from Scripture. But there's another way to look at it, too. And it goes like this. Mary is sitting by herself, and an angel of the Lord appears, and she's overwhelmed with fear and terror. And the angel says... You're going to have a child, and you're going to name him Jesus. It's just, how can this be? Because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a virgin. And he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you'll be with child. And she sort of comes to terms with it. And she goes and she tells her cousin Elizabeth. And Elizabeth is happy for her, so she begins to feel better. But there's this little problem whose name is, is Joseph. So she goes and tells Joseph, and Joseph hears this news. And Joseph's first response is, well, this can't stand. We're going to have to break up and get divorced. And then Joseph has a dream, and he comes to terms with it. And then there's a census being taken in Bethlehem. So Joseph and Mary pack up everything they've got, but they're tired, and they're weary. And she's at the end of her pregnancy, and it's an inconvenient time. But she gets on the back of this donkey, and he walks ploddingly in front of the donkey, exhausted and tired for these long 70 miles. And then they get to the inn, and, and you can picture the scene. You know, as they're getting close, you know, she gets out the little brochure. Oh, we're staying at, you know, Bob's Inn. And they get there. She's like, oh, it's right here around the corner. Good. Okay, where's the reservation? The what? Joseph says. I thought you took care of that. No, no, no. You were supposed to take, you were supposed to take care of that. And then the innkeeper comes out. Like, We've made a mistake. Do you have any extra rooms? Oh, I'll see what I can do. He goes and he gets something ready in the back. And then Joseph and Mary have a spirited conversation at the donkey. And finally they get tucked back there. And it's not some romantic little barn. We know from history actually that it's probably a damp grotto, kind of a cave carved out of the wall. And they're back there with the cows and the other animals. And they make a makeshift crib when the baby is born in Bethlehem, which they'd never expected. And they lie him in the manger. And then out in the wilderness, we have the shepherds. And the shepherds are out there, and they are minding their own business. And then all of a sudden, the angels show up, and they are terrified. And the angels speak to them and sing to them and tell them of this marvelous birth of good news of great joy for all people. And they go to check it out. And the wise men follow the star, and they foolishly go and tell Herod where this child is. But yet, they still make their way and kneel before him and offer their gifts. This, too, is a true story of the birth of Jesus. But which one of these is the truth? Which one of these is the one represents most clearly the world into which Jesus was born? Is it the sharp, focused image of that scene at the manger where everyone's gathering and worshiping and they believe the Lord? Or is it the one that's the broad angle picture where we see people filled with anxiety and trouble and worry and fear? The reality is, I think, that it's both of those. 
that Christmas is both of these things. On the one hand, it's this moment of calm and of peace and of wonder and of joy in the midst of a hectic, confusing, and broken world. But at the same time, it's also an event that happens in the midst of life's brokenness and ragged edges. It's both of these things. And really, could it be any other way? Because, you know, our lives are actually kind of like that, aren't they? Our lives are a mix of beauty and wonder and terrific things. And it's a mix of brokenness and heartache and disappointment. And here's one of the things I think that Christmas in the Gospels tells us. That Jesus, God with us, the Lord of heaven and earth, comes into the midst of it all. He comes to us in our joys. He comes to us in our sorrows. He comes to us when we feel like we've got it all together, and he comes to us when we feel like we're falling apart. He comes to us when we're overwhelmed with happiness. And he comes to us when we're so sad we're not sure that we'll ever see the light again. Scholars tell us that there's this term, this phrase that they use. It's called the scandal of particularity. What they tell us is the greatest scandal about God breaking into the world is this. That God came at a particular time in a particular place to a particular people. And lived among them and taught them and led them and loved them. And they say it's scandalous that God would come in a particular time in a particular place because other religions simply don't accept the fact that God would come to us because most religions would tell us that the gods are up here and we're down here and there's no way the twain can meet. But the Christian faith teaches us and the, the birth of Jesus teaches us that it's not too far of a distance for God to travel, to come to us. And our joys and our sorrows and our brokenness and our wholeness and all of these things. And when Jesus comes to us as a child, when he grows into a man, when he goes to Calvary and he gives his life, he came to us in the midst of a broken world that sometimes is shot through with beauty and with joy. But he comes to us so that we might, know, we might know that God is with us, that God loves us, that God walks with us and carries us through all of life. For us tonight, we're faced with this question, who is Jesus to me? Is he the one who comes as a light shining in darkness? Is he the one who comes into the midst of a broken world? Is he the one who comes to us in the midst of our joys and our happiness? I think the answer to all of that is yes. He is. He's the one that comes to us in all of life. Friends, tonight as we celebrate Christmas, my hope and my prayer for you is that this is a moment one of those times when it feels like all is right with the world. And if you feel that way, then give thanks to God, because it's a gift and a sign that God is with us. But if you're in a place where you don't feel like all is right in the world, but you feel the brokenness of the world, and you feel like you're seeing it face to face and up close, I hope that this Christmas is for you a time when you realize that God is with you, and that God sent his son, and that God loves you, and walks with you through everything, and in everything, because God came to us in the world as it is, to us as the people that we are, so we might be made whole, so we might know and experience God's love, and God's faithfulness to us. Let us pray.